Right, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. And I would note there is a dispute about whether we actually landed on the moon, and there is a dispute about whether the Earth is round, and there is a dispute about gravity in some places. Uh, but there is no. Sir. We'll get to you, Lord Moncton, shortly. But I want to talk to the scientists on the panel first, if that's okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McCarthy. I appreciate you bringing up the ocean of uh, the ocean acidification issue, which uh, Dr. Jane Lubchenco of NOAA has called the evil twin of climate change. And uh, I'd, uh, I'd like you to describe what actually happens to uh, species when they are exposed. And I, I want to put up a slide that I, I believe I got from Dr. Lubchenco. Uh, this slide basically shows uh, what happens when you put a pteropod, a small uh, a creature in the water on the left, you see its picture. These are relatively small, and this shows what happens when you put a pteropod in water that will be in the same acidic conditions that will exist in the year 2100 if we do not change our course. So it basically shows that the, according to Dr. Lubchenco, the pteropod melts. Its little calcium carbonate structure actually melts. And I just wonder if you can describe what the oceans will look like from an acidity standpoint in the next 100 years if we don't change course and what that does to the, the plankton that serves or could do to the, the bottom of the food chain. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, this, like a lot of the other change we're talking about, is uh, not simply a difference of one condition to another, but the time period over which it happens. So if we look at changes in the ocean over the last um, million years, every 100,000 years or so, uh, we saw ice advance, retreat. Uh, we saw organisms that lived in the high north moving closer to the equator during the cool periods, moving back on land and in the ocean. In fact, it's interesting, there are very, very few extinctions in that period that the memory, the genetics of organisms know in their history that being able to accommodate those changes is essential for survival. But when you crank those rates of change up, pH change during those periods, temperature change, when you crank those rates of change up 100 or close to 1,000 fold in some cases, then you exceed the capacity of ecosystems to adjust. Now, in this case, the pteropod, I, I was tempted to put a picture of a colorful uh, animal here. Pteropods are absolutely beautiful animals, and if you could have one in here in a beaker, they the, the foot of the mollusk is, is thin and flaps like a wing. They're called sea butterflies. You ever see them swimming? They're, they're really, they're just spectacularly beautiful with this very delicate shell. They're a very, very important part of the food web in the North Pacific, particularly for salmon. We know that the pink salmon depends heavily on the pteropod for its food. Now, it's just one example. I mentioned others, a microscopic plankton, the foraminifera, coccolithophorids, and of course, corals are all subject to this same condition. That is, as carbon dioxide is added to the ocean, more rapidly than it can adjust. And if, it, if this were being added over thousands of years rather than over 100, it would be a whole different story. More rapidly adjust, then the, the constant tension of the animal of trying to keep its skeletal material, its shell, from dissolving uh, becomes more and more in the favor of water. That is, water pulls those minerals back into solution. So this is the condition. And of course, we know in the past uh, there's been more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that, that in the past, uh, pH of the oceans has been different. We also know that there are periods in the past where organisms like this disappeared, that the conditions were not suitable for corals or mollusks to survive. So this is a very important issue. So I'm told that the, that the waters are more acidic, 30% 30, 30 more acidic than they were in pre-industrial times. What will they be at the end of the century, approximately? If things don't change? Well, I don't know how to express it in terms of percent, but if you take these extrapolations, as is done here experimentally, you can show what the effect would be of that, of that changing acid-base balance referred to in the vernacular as acidification. The oceans aren't becoming acid. They're becoming less alkaline, but, but it will dissolve these minerals. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I was impressed. We're here as the House of Representatives to have the, the state of the science discussed about climate change. And I was impressed that those who have denied the threat this poses to the planet Earth 
couldn't produce one scientist, not one scientist, to propose a hypothesis to explain what the Earth is going, undergoing, all the changes we're undergoing now. They produced somebody that doesn't even have a field, a background in scientists. And that's what they produced to try to convince Americans that somehow that this is a big hoax. I think that's impressive or unimpressive, depending how you look at it. So I want to ask about Lord Moncton's uh, viewpoint and basis for that. Uh, Lord Moncton, when did you start serving in the House of Lords? I, I noticed you brought fraternal greetings from the Mother of Parliaments to Congress to our athletic democracy. When did you start serving in the House of Lords? Uh, sir, I have never sat or voted in the House of Lords, as you have probably been informed. Thank you. The so basically, I want to understand. You of Lords Act. Thank you. You've, asked, you've answered my question. Yes. Y you come here, you call yourself a lord to try to convince the world to ignore something that threatens our grandkids, and you're not even a lord. Now, don't let me finish Sorry, sir, my just question, one then moment. I'll let you uh, speak. Just one moment, sir. No, excuse I me, am Lord Moncton, yes, excuse me, in lawyer. our athletic democracy, we'll ask the questions and you'll answer them. Thank you very much. Very well, but uh, you must not mistake, please, sir. Excuse me, you come to our athletic democracy, sir, calling yourself Lord Moncton. Not but only I are am. you not a scientist, you're not even a lord who served in the House of Parliament. Isn't that correct? in the House of Lords. Is it correct you did not I serve in the I House of Lords? I think I have already answered that one, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So we not only have the deniers who have denied this clear science upon which there is enormous global consensus. They cannot only not produce one scientist to deny this clear consensus. They can't even send us a real Lord from the House of Lords. Now, I think that says a lot about the status of this debate, which we should not be having, because we have an overwhelming consensus. And I note that it's not just by these four, four scientists. Joe Barton, our good friend, asked the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to review your testimony, Lord Moncton. And this is what they said, quote, the fact that globally average surface air temperatures has shown no trend or even slight cooling over the last seven years is not an accurate reflection of long-term general trends. In fact, calculation of a trend over the last seven years is a gross mischaracterization of the longer-term trend. The last seven years have been part of a strong warming trend that began in the 1970s, which is attributable to human influences, citing IPCC 2007. During the last seven years, six of the seven warmest years on record have been all been observed based on NOAA's global land and ocean data. Deducing long-term trends over such a short period of time is comparable to estimating the height of a sea swell by looking at the short period waves on top of a swell. Close quote. NOAA, the people who work for our athletic democracies have concluded we don't need a fake lord to tell us not to act. We need real science, and we need us to have a clean energy policy. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman.